Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen. And um, my aim in this talk was to, was to present a bit more in depth uh, information about wave mo um, surge and wave models, generally tied surge and wave models, um, but the 2D NEMO and the second talk, the next talk after this will be about the 3D NEMO model and what it can show. So this is my outline, a little bit about what is numerical modeling, the need for a 2D NEMO surge model, setting up and validating the model, and the importance of waves in coastal erosion and flooding, as I was just mentioning, and the principles of wave modeling and setting up the WaveWatch 3 wave model. And then I have a little exercise at the end if people want to follow setting up a swan wave model for local applications. But having seen how many of you are already doing wave modeling and so on, you have already probably um, got this expertise. You've never, it's, this is very much for if you've never done any wave modeling before, so you may want to just skip that. So I won't dwell on that, but um, I can give, get back to people if you have more questions about it. So a lot of this in the introductory part is just reiterating what um, Jenny has already said, but two important issues, one of which is what started our um, work in St. Vincent, which was the coastal erosion on the east coast of St. Vincent. Um, obviously, I'm sure everyone is aware, the causes of coastal erosion and flooding, but coastal erosion in particular, is interruption of the sediment supply, which can be the cross-shore, um, oops, I've obviously got a timer on that. We're skipping that slide. I'll try and go back. <laughs> right. Um, and so you've got not only sea level rise to contend with, but extreme events as well. And the effects being loss of land and habitat and destruction of infrastructure. And another example for St. Vincent is basically that um, they have the Windward Highway, which is um, at risk. And also the town of Georgetown, which are very much um, um, being impacted by a coastal erosion, which is happening at a rate of about two meters per year, which is quite a high rate. And obviously then this is a little schematic at the bottom, just showing where what sea level rise is doing and it's re reinforcing the message that, that um, also Simon was saying, if you have a large, a large raise in, in sea level, whether it was in a, an extreme event like a surge or, or an inexorable gradual rise of sea level, um, we are really going to have to take these very seriously because it brings the waves that closer to the shore, cause it's the waves that basically cause the damage at the shore. So we need models to predict water levels and waves, and the increasing water levels bring the waves further, wave impacts further inland. Um, Jenny's already explained this slide, so I won't uh, reiterate it again, but um, we've obviously got um, a, a gap where, um, where the Cayman Islands are in this, in this map. Um, and, and you can see here that the, the highest vulnerability uh, of five is actually to the north of the Caribbean in, in the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos Islands. And uh, that's really because the storm tracks tend to avoid the southern part of, of the Caribbean, Leeward Islands to some extent, and then they go right through the, um, the Greater Antilles. Um, and obviously the, the further north, um, the more intense the hurricanes are generally going to be. Uh, southern part of the Caribbean is, is a little bit away from the main hurricane belt. So this is what I was going to talk about in two parts. Um, one is tide and surge modeling. And here I'm just showing a couple of uh, schematics for anyone who doesn't really know what a model is. So many of you are way beyond this level. So I apologize if this is uh, too, too back in um, first steps. But the main point is that we take a bit of sea and it could be a coastal basin like is shown here, uh, where you discretize into boxes and solve the equations of motion. And it depends on what size of area you're interested in, whether it's at this kind of scale with a, a small embayment or if it's a global ocean. And then we're solving equations which can serve the mass and the momentum and also um, anything that's tra transported in the water. Um, we're transporting those things around with the flow. And there are, in, within a grid box, there are various dissipation processes going on and, um, and the water level will change. So um, solution methods, which I'm not going to go into at all, but many people will know about the options, which include finite difference methods, finite volume methods or finite elements, 
um, for the discretization of the equations. But then once you've got the equations in that form, you have to solve them by various numerical methods. And uh, definitely we're not going into that level um, of detail on, on what models are doing. But this is an example of uh, another model that was applied to um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and also Grenada by CFAS who implemented the Telemac model. And this shows how an unstructured grid can be used to get much higher resolution at the coast. And as you're already aware that the models we talked about initially, NEMO and WaveWatch 3, we're using um, structured grid or fixed grid models in latitude and longitude. So they do not have this high resolution at the coast. So this is our this is the NEMO model. And just to give some, some background on that, the nucleus for European modeling of the ocean is a state-of-the-art modeling framework, which has been used for both research and forecasting in ocean and climate sciences. And it's developed by a European consortium of which the National Oceanography is part. And you can see some links to show you more details about the model itself if, if you wanted to follow that up. And you should have these slides later to, to consult about links. So NEMO is used in many national centers across Europe and is the main type of ocean model which is used in the UK, like I said, at the National Oceanography Center and also at the Met Office. And it's used in the Copernicus modeling system which is a European uh, modeling system um, that, but it also um, provides links for um, global model outputs. And so that's why I'm showing this as being a relevant um, um, point of access for yourselves to get ocean monitoring and modeling data. It, it provides satellite products and it also provides model outputs. Um, and these will definitely be of use to people looking for um, some guidance about what is happening in their part of the world. This is just an example of the uh, sea surface temperature. And this is in the global 3D model. The, the full model is 3D, so that's the, the, um, the background, and there's going to be more information about that. Um, so this NEMO model version was used to generate the global model. I won't uh, go into any detail on that, but it's obviously forced, has to be forced by an atmospheric model as well. Uh, but the benefits of a regional model, which is what we were setting up, is that you've got a huge overhead in running the whole global ocean and relatively it's slow to run even on our UK um, Archer National Supercomputer. So the, the regional subdomain gives you much less um, computational need, but of course it also requires that you provide boundary conditions from a global model or some, some at least an, a larger area model. But the lower computational demands mean that we can explore more choices of uh, forcing data and also parameterization, which wouldn't be practicable otherwise. And, and so for this um, application to the Carib Caribbean, uh, we introduced tidal forcing, which wasn't present in the global model. It is being added to the global model, I should say, but it isn't, wasn't up to that point. And, and then you've got all these other forcing terms due to heat and freshwater flux and due to winds and sea level pressures um, that were taken from this reanalysis data set. And again, that's something you can access if you want to see more about it. A lot of this is accessible through the Copernicus Marine Systems portal. And then I'm going to zoom in on the 2D NEMO surge model for the Caribbean. And this version of the model was reduced even further to make it faster to run by reducing the number of depth levels to a minimum, um, which allows it mainly to simulate water levels due to tides and surges over timescales from days like hurricanes up to months and years. This is some of the um, locations where we have applied what's now called the relocatable NEMO. And you can see that there's a sort of a pink orangey um, uh, color shading over the, the Caribbean region, but we've also got a, um, a relocatable NEMO in the um, Western Indian Ocean, over East Africa and the Western Indian Ocean. There's one over South Asia. There's obviously one over the Northwest European Shelf, which was obviously our home grounds, and another one for Southeast Asia and so on. Back to the Caribbean, um, we can see that we have, you know, um, identified the small, many of the small 
island developing states in in the region not not every uh, island state is is a small island developing states by definition it depends on the um the level of income and and some small island developing states aren't even um islands like guyana um it's just uh, there is a list of, of places which qualify to be called small island developing states um apart from their obvious um uh characterization. So if we want to build a 2D ocean model from the 3D NEMO, as I've already mentioned, we're really only interested in getting the total water level from the model and not worrying about the details of the 3D profiles. So therefore, we've reduced these number of levels, layers, um, because we don't need that. And the model has constant temperature and salinity and density. So again, it's predicting water levels, but it's not giving us the, the detailed hydrographic structure and it's not predicting uh, at all changes in sea surface temperature, et cetera. And that model grid box just shows that all of the model elements um, have staggered locations within them. It actually gives us higher resolution by having the T and temperature and salinity at the center of a grid box, but the velocities on the faces, and um, that actually allows us to do the differencing where you have gradients in flow um, at a higher resolution effectively. And not much more to say about that, but uh, just the background. So if you want to set up NEMO, what do you need? And first of all, you need bathymetry. Um, there's some reason it doesn't do my first Oh, there we are. <laughs> you need to get the bathymetry we've already got. And then we need to get the, um, the coastlines. So we are defining our, our boundaries, coastal boundaries. We have also um, the tidal information, which we get from yet another model um, of the ocean tides. This is an example for the, the, the M2 component of tides. And then we have the atmosphere pressure and, and wind, and that's from this uh, ERA5, for example, although we do also use idealized models for, um, for a representation of the more intense hurricane winds. Then uh, if people want to follow this up, there is actually some training available in port portable NEMO. Um, this link is still available, um, but you might have to come back to uh, Gabby who you will see tomorrow, Gabby Mayorga Adami, who is um, who's doing the sargassum tracking tomorrow. Um, but the, the, the link I'm told is still available if you want to go through this workshop exercise of uh, setting up a small NEMO model. And then we use uh, tide gauges and wave boys for model validation. So there are, a number of tide gauges in the Caribbean. Some are more operational than others. Um, we, we did try and um, also within our project, we, we've looked at the tide gauge, um, the tide gauges that are operational and looked at some software that'll allow people to actually get tide gauge data. I've obviously got this timing on my slides, I apologize. Um, but we've also got half a dozen wave boys, uh, mostly in rather deep water, in the area so we can um, help to uh, validate the models. We obviously appreciate the validation of the model is, is extremely important in order to make sure it's doing something sensible for the area um, where, where you're interested in. And um, yeah, so this is showing how well it uh, agrees for tides. Um, and this is the great diurnal tidal range over the Caribbean area. We obviously know that the tides are rather small in the Caribbean um, microtidal, uh, but it's actually still a very useful uh, thing to look at the tidal variability because it does give us a validation in, in time, a rather detailed um, in time resolution um, of the 12 hour tide so that you can actually see that um, the phase of the tide is correct, the water level, it, water is moving around as it should. Um, and this is an example of Bridgetown Barbados where the sea level was validated from actually from the 3D model, but you can see that in general, the, um, the red and blue lines overlay fairly well. The top is a, a full year, but there are times when the, um, the blue, it does not, um, you know, the water level that's been recorded at the tide gauge is actually outside of the, of the red curve. 
Um, so I'm going to zoom in on the on the middle panel. You're zooming in on some uh, detail of the non-tidal residuals. So having got the tide and seeing that uh, they're generally in phase and they're reproducing the tidal variation of half a meter or so, then we can look at, they take the tides out and look at what's happening in the rest of the signal. And sometimes this is, this is in agreement and at other times it's not so much in agreement. I think this is something that needs a bit further exploration. But just as an example on the bottom, we have zooming into Hurricane Thomas in October 2010. And this is actually showing that the maximum non-tidal residual was quite well reproduced by the model. But there are excursions in the water level that are not captured by the model. And Partly this may be due to the fact that in this case, we're looking at a 2D model where we're not looking at the, um, the variability in, in the density and the, um, sets, in other words, um, temperature and salinity. There are other effects going on that are affecting water level, which are not being captured um, in purely by the wind and pressure driven surge effect. Um, we have looked at the, the pattern of circulation in the models to see if it's doing something sensible. And this is, um, this is not a direct one-for-one -one co um, comparison. This is just a qualitative comparison looking at the main current streams. And this, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got um, an average of the NEMO surface currents over 2010. And on the right, some drift trajectories where you can see that the, the core of the currents um, are, you know, there is basically the Guyana current coming in from the southeast and, and then flowing through in, as the, the Caribbean current and then going into the Gulf of Mexico loop current. And, and that has a lot of variability, which we aren't really um, interested in particularly, but um, it's gone beyond our, our model by then. And then the, the model current comes out and, and follows the coast of Florida and into the Gulf Stream. So um, now, uh, Jenny's already mentioned the, the, some of the detail of Hurricane Ivan simulations, um, which we realized was an important storm. But as it was approaching and entering the Caribbean, it wasn't as intense as it was further to the west. So um, it was category five at its maximum. And again, um, Jenny showed some of these results, but I think she showed Hurricane Ivan, this is for Hurricane Thomas, which as I said, was in October, 2010. It was only a category one, but it did pass very close to St. Vincent, which is why we chose it as a, as a study, um, a case study. And what we've got here is, on the right, is basically trying to illustrate what, um, what Jenny mentioned before. As you can see that the track itself um, is, it, the, the, the maximum surge is actually directly underneath in a up and down version in a you know in the vertical um is directly below and it's because it's basically what we're seeing here is 20 centimeters of um, inverse barometer surge and this is not going to um give a very large problem to St. Vincent shall we say at this this particular thing that happened and then we have on the left the outputs from the regional wave model where the waves reaching over six meters. Let's go back again. But uh, they were they were more to the uh, north. The main direct, uh, most direct impact was um, a bit to the north, and uh, Saint Lucia got more effect of the waves than than uh, did Saint Vincent. Another thing that we we've been uh, mapping as well is the uh, sea level trends, um, because as I already mentioned, sea level rise is actually one of the biggest risk factors, even though a hurricane event at the time is, is a, a very significant impact. But what is something we, we can't have no way of stopping is this um, continuing rise of sea level. But it's also showing on the left panel, you're seeing that the, there is a global mean trend of three, meter, three millimeters per year towards, the, well, in recent, recent time. Um, and this has been removed, but it shows that there's a pattern in sea level um, so that at the, uh, the, the South American coast and further north, there are maxima, whereas in the center of the basin, there's a relative um, low point in sea level. We're still only talking about half a millimeter per year change, but it is, uh, you know, there is a noticeable difference in the pattern across the Caribbean. 
On the right hand side, we've got the trend in time. And this is showing us how where we are now around 2020, um, we are not um, seeing that huge um, rise in sea level that's projected for later part of the century. That is, is already accelerating and is, is in, expected to accelerate further. And the curves that you can see, you know, this exponential growth is very important um, to be aware of because it's, got, it's going to be not just the um, um, potential for a half a meter, if we take the sort of fairly conservative estimate, but the, the, the error bars, if you like, the envelope of the worst case scenario in the end of the century could be up to nearly two meters sea level rise. Right, um, that was the first half about um, tide and surge modeling. And then I was going to come on to um, wave modeling. Did anybody have a question at this point? Um, do you want to break or shall I just carry on? I can't see unless I stop sharing. I'll just stop sharing for a moment. Uh, I can see if, a few messages in the chat. If everyone's happy, we can just carry on. Um, yeah, Simon shared a, a, an, an image, a little sketch of an example of, of, of um, sort of a, a hurricane direction that might be quite damaging to Kingstown and St Vincent. So that's quite interesting. I'll, I'll try and open that. <laughs> well, maybe I'll look at this in, in a bit. But I absolutely agree with you. And, and the town of Leo has already had a, a setback in the seawall um, in order to protect itself from. And we are seeing the effect of sea level rise. Plus, they are also seeing the effects, as I was saying before, of, of, um, of waves contributing to waves set up contributing to, if you like, the observed surge. It isn't necessarily always a surge, um, if by strict definition of what is a surge. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly they, they have had flooding and, uh, and we expect that sea level will contribute a great deal to that. Um, and if they had a direct uh, category five hurricane impact, that would be no doubt very severe. Um, you know, it's not the not the location that's going to be most likely to get that direct impact, but not to dismiss it as a, a not a possibility. So I'm going to go back to the slides. I think I have to share them again. But the other point that you're making, um, uh, Simon, is really that you know people live on the low-lying land at the coast. That is, that is the most useful place to be. So, oh, no, from current slide, right? Can you see my slides again? Hopefully, they're they're visible. Yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, so can't make it change now. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this is this is um, um, I don't know whether people would have seen this before, but it's showing where the energy is in the sea, and um, important to note that wind waves have got the highest amount of energy density, if you like. The tides on the left-hand side at the tidal period of about twelve hours, um, twenty-four hours, have an intense um, peak of uh, energy, and then we get into long period waves, and then up to the wind waves, the dominant energy in the sea. And of course, this is very much where um, the energy is in the offshore domain. And, and when you get to the coast, that's uh, another story. So what happens at the coast? Well, so this is a, a map of wave energy over the global ocean. And just to show the mean power density in kilowatts per meter, and if you think of that amount of energy coming ashore at the coast, um, then in general, on average, uh, the Caribbean isn't getting so large an amount. In the Northwest European, uh, North Atlantic and Northwest Europe, we, are, we do get quite a, a high energy density. And in the Southern Ocean, of course, you have the, the largest energy density of waves altogether because the waves um, and the winds are waves and are uninterrupted as they flow around this, they, as they blow and flow around the Southern Ocean, and so they can get to the largest possible um, energies. Um, but 
it's still a significant amount of power in any any coastline and of course we have the shoaling effects and what is um, quite a small wave in in the offshore as it gets into the shallower intermediate water it starts to get um, um, amplified and steeper but then it, it also is going to be limited by depth limited breaking and and then it becomes uh, very much limited by the total water depth in that near very near shore zone so some of the processes that we have to think about when we are modeling waves and of course again the um we don't need to reiterate really but uh, the waves are important for building up and breaking down shorelines they are what what um what creates beaches and um, and the transport of sand on and off beaches and also along shore um and the effect of, of undercutting of of cliffs and making bays and headlands and so on depending on the geology um are, are extremely important so the waves are really the thing that's um the energy that's impacting the coast and the largest waves form when the wind is very strong blows steadily for a long time and blows over a long distance so we'll come back to that but as an example a wave three meter high transmits energy at 100 kilowatts per meter at its of its crest line and that is a lot of energy coming up along onto the shore um, at every bit of the coast of the world an interesting point is to um, note that coral reefs can absorb 97% of wave energy approaching the shore. And if you have a healthy coral reef, which is um, doing its job, um, is near the surface of the sea, and it can serve as a natural breakwater, which reduces wave energy. And of course it damages the reef, but in general, if it's a resilient reef, it can it will stand a certain amount of, of damage, of mechanical damage being done, and it is protecting the shore behind it. But as we know, coral reefs are struggling for many reasons, including this, the rise in sea level is, uh, and also sea surface temperature and also ocean acidification. So all those things are, are really causing reefs to struggle very much. And it's taking away that benefit that they provide to the coastline. Right, so going back to basics, this is just some definitions of the wave parameters. Um, the wave amplitude, um, is the height above or below this, the mean sea level. The wave crest is obviously the highest point. The wave trough is the lowest point. And the wavelength is the distance between two, success, two successive crests. In particular, if you're looking at a swell wave, you can see those distinct features. Um, and the wave height is actually twice the, the wave amplitude. So it's the distance from trough to crest. And the wave energy is proportional to the wave height squared. That just gives us some basic um, parameters to work with. So are we going to be looking at global, regional or, or local modeling? Well, obviously we are trying to focus on the, on the regional modeling at this point in time. Um, the global model, obviously there are, there are a few issues. What type of models do you use and so on? In general, all the models I'm going to be talking about are spectral wave models. They're looking at the application of quite large areas and you make some approximations um, to look at the energy in the waves rather than looking at individual waves. The actual crests and troughs are not resolved because that is another much more in computer intensive type of wave model. And it wouldn't allow you to look at the, over the large distances that we're focusing on. So um, in regional, and as, as we have in the center, our focus is, is going to be of the order of um, at 10 kilometers resolution maybe, um, looking at synoptic scale events, and looking at enclosed seas. In our case, we're looking at the Caribbean, which is a somewhat semi-enclosed um, arm of the North Atlantic and um, deep to intermediate depths, but also spectral wave models are carried right up to the local coastline. And I was going to um, talk about SWAN as a, a, a very useful coastal model as well. But what do we have? Um, we, ha we can choose the resolution and we can choose whether we have a nested model or we use something like an unstructured grid, grid refinement, which gives us a model that's more versatile over a larger distance and right up to the detail of the coastline. So um, again, just reiterating, um, waves are very important in general for any ocean operations, 
ship routing enforces on offshore, offshore structures, but of course they cause this damage at the coast. I completely, you know, agreed, whether that in, especially when there are extreme water levels. And we're looking at particularly, again, what are the, going to be the effects of climate change? So coastal engineers have to deal with waves. And um, I'm glad to say I'm not a coastal engineer because I think that's the hardest job of anyone. You, you get a thankless task. Whatever you do, whatever you put on the coastline, um, it's going to cause some effects elsewhere. So, but basically um, we have also, uh, the importance of waves is partly because they actually control many processes such as air sea interaction and seabed current turbulence interactions in shallow water. And we have done a lot of work in the past on coupled wave models. And our first um, approach to the Caribbean modeling was to use uncoupled models, but we can easily and intend to move into the coupled models, which we have used um, successfully around European coasts. So the principles are, you know, they already said waves grow due to the wind. The wind is the forcing that makes waves. And um, the stronger the wind, the larger the waves. The longer the wind blows, the larger the waves until they reach an equilibrium with that, um, that fetch limited or duration limited uh, sea state. So the second point, the third, fourth point was that um, the longer the fetch over which the wind blows, the larger the waves. Um, and then we solve the wave energy um, equation with terms representing the wave growth due to wind and the exchange event of energy between waves at different frequencies, and then the various dissipation terms, which include white capping, depth limited breaking, and bottom friction. So the main um, sink term of the energy is white capping in deep water in, in, uh, in the deep ocean. And what happens is that as you blow uh, wind over the sea, it enters at high frequency waves, and those waves then actually exchange energy until the, the, the wave's energy moves from a high frequency down to a low frequency. And this is just showing an example of a, a spectral energy density um, plot, where you have frequency of waves on the, on the horizontal axis and the energy on the vertical axis. And basically it's uh, showing how you might combine two C states, one which would be a long period swell at 0.08 frequency or just, just around 10 second, maybe 10 to 12 second period. And then you maybe have some wind C which is growing due to a storm and that might be at higher frequencies and it may be five to, um, five to eight seconds period. And if you combine the two, you get those two separate wave trains combining together to get the total uh, frequency spectrum. That has been a very useful way of us describing the waves uh, in the sea rather than trying to represent every single wave that comes along. And this is uh, the dynamic um, effect, uh, dynamic fetch effect, which uh, Simon touched on. And basically when you have a storm that's moving at a certain speed, the effective fetch, the revolving winds in a certain quadrant can, can uh, add to the uh, generation. The, the, the effectively, the waves are traveling. At, if you have the um, optimum speed of, of the waves traveling, they are traveling at the same speed as the, as the storm and they're also getting continuously fed um, instead of the storm moving on and leaving the waves behind, it's actually traveling, they're traveling together and it continues to feed energy in. And so you do get an effect whereby the waves in a certain quadrant are enhanced. So let's go back to what we do with the wave model. So we believe that wave models do a very good job of modeling waves, but they're not perfect. So you have to be looking at what are they doing well and what are they not doing well? And Jenny showed um, some boy comparisons uh, over a range of the boys in the Caribbean. And in general, for a lot of the time, the wave um, model is doing a really good uh, job. But if we look at the peak of an event, and here we're looking at Hurricane Thomas again, at a particular wave boy, we can see that the model, which is red, is not reaching the level of the waves that were observed at that buoy at the peak of the storm. Um, and this we attribute largely to the fact that the course resolution of the wind fields from the reanalysis data sets that we've used to force the model are not capturing the intensity of the storm, the hurricane winds. And we've addressed this by using an idealized model of hurricane winds using the IB tracks, um, um, 
wind fields, which wind and pressure fields, which have recorded um, historical hurricanes. And that allows us to um, get the maximum of the wind field more accurately. And then you can look at other details of the model, but it's basically showing that offshore for the regional model, the wave model is doing a really good job. Um, but the limitation being the maximum wind speed is not necessarily captured in this case. So we're looking at uh, the Caribbean wave model here, which was run using WaveWatch 3. Um, I won't tell you very much about this because you'll be hearing a bit more about this um, from Lucy Bricheneau on Thursday. Um, but the model wave height at St. Vincent um, can be seen at the peak, uh, the, the peak of the wave height if you like, in that location of that part of the, um, just outside of the, uh, of the Caribbean um, at the peak, um, which reached uh, six to seven meters. So again, I'm not going to um, dwell on this too much, but another thing we can use the wave, um, the model, wave model for is to generate Stokes drift. And this is a surface mass transport that um, is generated by waves. And this is one of the things I wanted to um, emphasize because the wave field is not just the waves per se, but it actually has, it generates a mean transport which contributes to the um, ocean circulation field as well. So these average effects, because winds, uh, waves are effectively nonlinear effects, they are producing these mean flow effects there. It is a, it is a coupling effect of the waves on the mean flow. Um, and this is just an example um, for January 2020 of the wave model output of, of the Stokes drift. And you can see that there is a net drift from northeast to southwest, basically driven by the trade winds. And you're also seeing several things. You're seeing that, um, well, I'll just tell you that the, the wave height um, is, is the main factor which drives Stokes drift, if you like. So they're related. So if you... Um, you can see that the wave height and, and the Stokes drift reach a maximum just outside of the Leeward Islands, and then they have a sheltering effect. And so they start growing again from the westward side of the islands as you get towards the Central American mainland or you know, the, the fetch limit, if you like, of, of this wave model. So there is a larger, the maximum is um, in the southwest of the Caribbean. Um, this amount, the size of this Stokes drift is about 14 centimeters per second. And it's about 10% of the ambient current at times. So it's not negligible, but it's not the majority. It's not the largest contribution. But as I said, I will um, not show too much about this because um, Lucy Bricheneau is going to uh, talk a bit more about this. I think I've managed to use the same slide twice. Um, coastal modeling. So. This is where we need to use other models. We're, we're starting with a, a large scale regional model, but then we are nesting within that some of the smaller models right down to a coastal model for Argyle International Airport, the region of South, Southeast St. Vincent, where we're looking with the SWAN model, we're looking at the details of the coastal wave effects. And it's also showing the model that was used by CFAS. Again, the unstructured Telemac and Tomawak model, which does have coupled wave and water level effects in it. Um, as many of you know already, that um, there was a, a LIDAR bathymetry survey done for St. Vincent, Grenada, and the Grenadines in 2016 to 17 at the beginning of the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme. And this gives a lot of detail um, in very shallow water of the bathymetry. Um, uh, unfortunately, there is no um, a coast shallow, there's not a very big Carroll um, coastal zone uh, around St. Vincent. And um, sorry, I've got a, a call coming in my phone, which I'm trying to ignore. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, but. We can see that there is a certain amount of, of the of the the um, the bathymetry is 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 uh, sampled down to about thirty meters water depth, and there is a wider strip on the southwest southeast coast of St Vincent, but um, in a lot of um, St Vincent because it's a steep sided volcanic island, there is not a lot of shallow water around the coast. That's not to say people aren't living close to the waterline. Of course they are. 
And these are some of the measurements um, that were made by the AWAC, which was deployed off the East Coast. And just to show that it was um, due to, that with the maximum that was observed was due to the track of Tropical Storm Kirk, which um, went across in uh, uh, October 2018. And it actually generated a maximum wave height of about 3.8 meters and a maximum peak period uh, just a bit later of 18 seconds, which is a pretty long waves. Waves that reach 18 seconds in length can do quite a lot of damage at the coast and uh, are sometimes more significant than higher waves that have um, a, a smaller peak period. So that is significant for some of the coastal modeling that we did, but I won't dwell on that at the moment. And I think Lucy will re reflect on this as well. So my, the last part of my talk was just to give a quick demo of how you would go about downloading the SWAN code and, um, and running it if you wanted to do such a thing. I wasn't sure how many people would, so I was going to ask you to just put in the chat whether or not you'd be interested in following this exercise. And I can put the notes which are on, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the Google Docs link. I'll put uh, the notes there if you want them and a couple of files that you need to just do a very simple test run. But if you, if you already use SWAN, then you, you can ignore this part. There's only a couple of slides about it. But basically SWAN is actually a model that's been used to run quite extensive areas. Like it could be used over the whole Caribbean. It has been used over the North Sea and the Northwest European shelf. Um, but in general, it's, it's developed in order to have a fairly fast, high resolution coastal wave model. Um, and you can go to the link and download the code, get the latest version, gives you the model executable, you don't need to compile it. And then you can go um, to the SWAN homepage and download the implementation manual and the user manual, which are very useful and easy to follow. And it gives you all the background. And if you do intend to use SWAN at all regularly, do subscribe to the mailing list and don't forget to give them credit for their work. Um, it was originally developed, um, supported by the Office of Naval Research in the States and is now partly funded by Rijkswaterstaat in the Netherlands. But the example of what we, we set up and ran um, was a, a very limited uh, extent model which just extends about 20 kilometers along the coast and about um, five kilometers, but I've forgotten how much it is offshore. But you can obviously see its, uh, its um, coastal extent and it goes out into the relatively deep water offshore and, and then it captures the area around um, um, the airport. And also it reaches as far as the, uh, the northern headland that you can just see within the wave model is um, Black Point, where is, which is where we had our, our wave model observations, uh, sorry, wave observations from the AWAC, which allows us to look at some um, coastal wave transformation in that region and validate it against the observations. So that is all I was going to present right now. As I say, if you have any questions, we're going to have a break now and um, a 10 minute break, I think I'll let